The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Governments today face staggering economic challenges. I'm Jane Jackanothan. Tonight on the Agenda in the Summer, as we look back at the big Ontario debates that are still relevant today, was the approach of Bob Ray's NDP government on deficit spending ahead of its time? That's next. In the early 1990s, Ontario's first new Democratic Party-led government faced a wicked recession and budget crunch. They proposed something controversial and new. Spend your way out of the slowdown. Here's a glimpse of some of our past coverage on TVO. I'm a trade unionist uh, and I really believe in the importance of living up to the contract, the collective agreement. It's the, you know, it, it, you can't just do that by legislation. We did, and it was soul destroying for many of us. The intent behind it was absolutely the right thing and absolutely saved um, thousands and thousands of jobs. And so it, 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 it was just a, a horrendous um, experience to go through. I remember several years later in 2008 getting uh, an email from Bob. He was down in Florida at Christmas time and he sent me a link to, I don't know if it was the Wall Street Journal, but there was an article about companies that were doing time sharing, job sharing uh, at, to try and get through the recession. And he said, look, look, you know, it's, it's taking hold. And I said, don't ever think that you're going to be rehabilitated on this one. <laughs> As many people who think that that was a, a just thing to do to try and attempt to spread the pain and to share in uh, getting us back on track, the uh, legislated end to collective agreements was a low mark for the NDP government. Here was Ray in an unprecedented situation who was trying to do the right thing for a lot of workers so they weren't losing their job to protect them in the recession. And, and too many within the union movement I, uh, weren't going to, weren't prepared to do a deal. And the whole, uh, to me, I thought the social contract process was, was a very unique way, uh, a very true to a socialist principle way to try and solve it. This is a government which has brought in incredible um, uh, restrictions on business. Uh, Bill 40, the labor legislation, for example. I mean, Bill Davis, I, I was going to say, would be he turning in his grave. Great. Thank heavens he's not, but he would, <laughs> you know, 102 years from now. Um, I think the, the tremendous amount of, of regulation that's been put on, I think the loss of confidence that was cost what, our what, provincial... What, what, if I could just finish, please, please Hugh. I don't, I don't the loss promise. of confidence that, that was caused in the investment community by trying to spend their way out of that first uh, a recession budget and take the, the, the traditional socialist way. It clearly didn't work. It was out of keeping however, with the time. However, however... And with that in place, joining us now from the nation's capital, economist Armin Yalnesian, Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers, and in Dufferin County in central Ontario, Jane Pepino, who was a progressive Conservative Party activist at the time, as you just saw there. She's a partner at Arid and Burles LLP and founder of their municipal and land use planning group. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Glad to be here. So Jane, we're going to start with you, a little bit of, uh, you know, going through memory lane there. Uh, that clip was more than 25 years old. I have to ask, have your views changed from that time? Uh, I think they have. Um, as, as with all things in aging, um, things get moderated. Um, uh, looking back, I realize how very difficult it must have been for the Ray government at the time. And I do think that, although I don't agree with everything that happened, and um, I think there are I'm happy to get into it uh, later, but there was so much upset and angst. Um, I do think that the <clears throat> uh, whole concept of work share, of uh, supporting workers through tough times, trying to spread the pain has been picked up uh, and is um, much more popular now than it was 25 years ago uh, and is a worthy thing that um, was tried. I think there were a lot of flaws. Uh, I think also the whole issue of the um, uh, sort of spending your way back into um, prosperity is something that, given the right circumstances, and the Ray government didn't have them at the time, in my judgment, uh, has been proven to work. 
example, we'll get into that. I want to set the stage. We'll start economically. So Armin, 1990, one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression, or one of the great worst recessions in the Great Depression. Bob Ray, his NDP government, come in. What, uh, what do they walk into? They walk into um, the Ontario economy shrinking by 4%, um, while interest rates rise by 14%. We had a Made in Canada recession. John Crow was looking for zero inflation in the wake of very high inflation rates in the 1980s that resulted in housing spikes in, um, in Toronto and in um, Vancouver, which he attempted to address by system-wide hikes in interest. Um, when Bob Ray was elected, John Crow had increased um, interest rates weekly at one point. Mm -hmm. Um, so the hikes were way bigger than any economic growth could have been in any case. But at that time, the Ontario economy was shrinking as a result of three different things. The first was the impact of the free trade agreement in 1988 that was signed at the end of 1988, uh, accelerated what was already occurring in the Ontario industrial heartland, which was deindustrialization. The second thing was uh, the interest rates that were rising, you know, no matter what, <laughs> were also killing businesses and reducing both investments and expansions, which in the 1980s was uh, large companies deciding to do new things. And then by the 1990s, they were deciding to downsize or right size back to core competency. So there was a flood of um, private sector layoffs already baked into the system. And the third thing that was really difficult for Ontario was not only deindustrialization, not only monetary policy that hit the, the city hard, not only a, a state of uh, private sector downsizing, but the beginnings of rumblings that uh, what the Peterson government had been doing was not dealing with uh, the growing social lack of social cohesion. So at the end of the 80s, we were also talking about the need for social assistance reform, for minimum wage hikes and stuff like that. That's what Bob Ray campaigned on. He won. What a horrible time to inherit the crown. <laughs> well, let's let's start uh, talking about some of those rumblings. Jane, I'm hoping you can set the scene for us uh, politically before the Ray Days and the social contract. You know, here we are with a government that won about 38% of the vote, had increased their seats from 19 to 74. What exactly was he dealing with once he came in power? I think he was handed a very, very difficult um, um, situation at that point. To Armini's point, the Peterson government had not come to grips with some fairly crucial things having to do with social supports, but by the same token had been spending and spending and spending and embedding structural um, uh, obligations that carried with it tremendous uh, salary obligations for the public sector as one example. Infrastructure had been let lag a little bit, infrastructure uh, spending. So the, the major problem was that about over 60% of the budget went to salaries. And that was the largest single area that I think had to be uh, addressed <clears throat> and the choices were, of course, just cut the jobs. As as Armini said, the the private sector was trying to right size, downsize, do those sorts of things. This government made the decision to not do that to try to save tens of thousands of jobs, but but at the same token, on this so-called three-legged stool, cut some spending somewhere, um, ask people in the public sector to sort of tighten their belts and share the load by taking up to 12 unpaid days uh, annually. And then finally, increases in taxes. And I think all of those things were so hard on the private sector because people there were losing their jobs. Unemployment was much higher in the private sector than it was in the public sector. So there was a real disconnect um, between people who saw themselves as have-nots suddenly and looked at the public sector and said, they're not losing their job. I've lost mine and I'm having to pay more taxes. It was a really difficult time and the, the political um, equations were very tough indeed. 
Armin, uh, we touched a little bit on the social contract that was introduced, obviously, in 1993. The finance minister at the time was dealing with a whopping $12 billion deficit. Um, Jane touched on uh, the three-legged stool as well. Do you mind explaining a little bit about that and, and sort of the, the social contract there? Yeah, the uh, Ray government was trying to reduce the deficit because that was what everybody did, no matter what the underlying economic conditions were and how impossible they were. And don't forget, by raising the interest rates at the federal level through monetary policy, it made paying back and having a shrinking um, economy, it meant that we were paying more for debt while we were losing revenue. It was a diabolical combination. So they were looking at ways of reducing the deficit. And they did it basically in the three-legged stool refers to about $2 billion in savings in public service payroll, uh, which only affected people making more than $30,000 a year, roughly $50,000 in today's dollars, and would have saved between 20 and 40,000 jobs, depending on who would have been cut. Um, about another $2 billion in expenditure reductions, a billion of which came out of health care, about another almost half million came out of education, um, and the rest coming from, the, the bulk of the rest coming from transfers to municipalities. And then the third part of it was tax increases. This was, I mean, when I went back and took a look at what were the tax increases, it, it looks like it was 30 years ahead of its time. An introduction of a corporate minimum tax on profitable firms of 8%. That's what we're talking about globally right now. Uh, surtaxes, not taxes on everybody. They refused to increase sales taxes. So surtaxes on those who were the best off during the recession. And that's what we're talking about now. The people that made a ton of money uh, should be paying more during this recession. And the third thing was uh, taxing real estate speculators, how, how those people made money, and taxing people with large estates that they were passing on to the next generation. We already have a probate tax. They were just going to increase the amount on large estates, which would be the equivalent of about $2 million today, which I think a lot of people hearing that today think $2 million. That's not very much, but that just shows you how to uh, like it was a lot of money back then and our appetite we've seen asset inflation asset expectation inflation take place so that it probably doesn't sound as shocking as it did back then um anyway so the, those that was the three-legged stool and i, I do want to underscore that between 20 and 40,000 jobs were saved we did lose 5,000 jobs and those ray days of up to 12 days a year to be taken without pay was to happen over three years. But to Francis Lankin's point, it wasn't negotiated. Right. It was a unilateral move on the part of the government. There was a process for negotiating a different type of deal that was rejected by the government. So contracts were torn up and I would just Say to you, if a business contract was torn up in the middle of a recession, you'd get an earful from the business community. It's a contract. So, you know, it was, it was to Francis Lankin's point, the low point of the relationship between the people who brung them to the dance and the people they were dancing with. We'll definitely get into that a little bit later when we talk about negotiations. I want to bring Jane in. Um, can get a sense uh, from what Armin said, um, you know, how did this go over on Bay Street? I'm going to assume not. Not so well. Not so well. And uh, just to set the stage a bit, I was talking to a colleague earlier today about that time, and he was in the law school graduating class uh, called to the bar in 1990. And out of 330 people, six of them, six of them had jobs. There was a whole generation of young folks graduating who didn't get hired at all, or if they got hired, got laid off or fired by the end of uh, 1990 into 1991. It was brutal. Um, and I think the other thing that was happening is there was this whole issue of, of discontent, of, of uh, unbalance about the social contract itself, about our social safety net. Um, as Armin said, the uh, cuts came to education, they came uh, to healthcare, hospitals, uh, doctors, uh, the Ontario Medical Association and the, all the teachers' unions were protesting. It was a very unsettling time. 
um, everywhere. It wasn't just Bay Street. It was Main Street as well. Now, I mean, I want to talk about stimulus budgets. It's something that we talk about now all the time. And you had mentioned a little bit, you know, this was ahead of its time. Um, it wasn't well accepted. Why not? Oh, I think it's easy to label a government that was doing what it was doing as socialist, and we are not a socialist country. Uh, what I find really fascinating, when, when I, I had the privilege of hearing Jane speak ahead of this conversation, so I went to take a look at what were the nefarious things they did to the business community. Clearly, an 8% corporate minimum tax would get up some people's nose. Clearly, <laughs> um, there, are, there were some measures that would uh, be bothering the business community, but some of the biggest issues that Jane pointed to, the labor issues, that was preventing corporations from hiring replacement workers who were on for people who were on strike, preventing scab behavior, which is something that the union movement have, has been like, you've got one tool, which is to withhold your labor. And if it's legal to hire somebody to replace you, then you have no tool. Um, and the other thing was the employment equity legislation, which business community said would uh, drive away investors. But in fact, it's what we're talking about again, 30 years later, is reducing inequalities as a way of maximizing employment growth. Um, and so I think, again, it was ahead of its time. Um, and, you know, in vaudeville and in politics, timing is everything. <laughs> so I think they just... Um, they gave people what they wanted to. Uh, Jane's point about uh, cuts to healthcare and education, and that the public sector didn't lose jobs when the private sector was losing jobs. That is the nature of the public sector. The demand for public services and healthcare and education don't change because the economy is going downhill. Of course, there's going to be fewer cuts in the public sector. But the desire to spread the pain is real. And that was also a fight within the labor, the House of Labor between private sector unions and public sector unions. So Bob Ray couldn't have won. I mean, he didn't handle it well. The government did not handle the negotiations well for the social contract. Uh, they didn't market it well. They didn't negotiate well. They acted like they were the smartest people in the room instead of actually being in conversation with the House of Labor. But within the House of Labor, there was no agreement either. And it, the private sector unions in the House of Labor have always been more powerful. Well, we're more powerful at that time than the pro public sector unions. So it was easy to cream them, and they did. They creamed them. Not only did they introduce the uh, social contract for three years, Floyd Lochran, the finance minister, said, this is now going to be permanent. It's like, right. what? <laughs> why? If this was a re recession fighting mode, why is that per permanent? So, you know, they lost a lot of goodwill. I want to I want to touch on that, Jane. You also talked about uh, protesters and, and, and picket lines. Uh, you also came in direct contact with some of that anger um, and stuff. Can you share some of those stories? Well, um, the most vivid um, memory I have is walking my children to school and having to cross picket lines to get them into the school, and they were upset. They didn't understand what was happening necessarily. Um, they did know that their teachers weren't getting paid, and one of my children, I've forgotten which one was really worried that perhaps um, a teacher wouldn't have enough food to eat. Mm. So there was there was just a trickle down that was so upsetting. Walked into a hospital, there were, you know, doctors were saying that they didn't have this supply and that we were going to have to wait for the following. Things just sort of started to feel like our social supports were, were unraveling, but it left um, a big gap, a big level of, of upset and frankly, mistrust uh, in the sectors uh, that were, the, I think, the most important, uh, particularly to the next generation, uh, being education. That's where the massive day-to-day -day, um, rub came in all the time. Now, I think it's easy to look back 30 plus years and look at the social contract and say, how could we do better? And that's obviously my next question. Uh, Armin, this was pushed through legislatively, not a negotiated contract. How could this have been done better? Well, I think negotiation is the heart of um, democracy, that you talk to one another, you don't impose. But I, can I just loop back to mm -hmm. what Jane just said? Because in 1995 and 1996, I too walked through picket lines 
um, in front of schools because John Snowballin cut $1 billion, not $347 million, but $1 billion out of the education budget. Uh, the Harris government came in and consolidated, amalgamated municipalities, cut funding to lower levels of government and increased responsibilities. Uh, it was just like, so it, the, the stage was set again with the Ray government doing things that nobody wanted because of fiscal pressures um, that just accelerated with the next government that came in that campaigned and won on tax cuts and welfare cuts. Things got unraveled rather quickly. So whatever we're talking about, how the social contract could have been done better, things got a lot worse in the uh, in the next administration. Jane mentioned that we deferred um, infrastructure builds, and we did for 25 years. We deferred maintenance of critical physical infrastructure, and the trade-off was more cash in your pockets, tax cuts. It was said that tax cuts create jobs. I had that bumper, uh, I had that fridge magnet on my fridge. It's like the most ridiculous economic <laughs> statement in the world. And yet they campaigned on it and won. They convinced people that tax cuts create jobs. And what it did was it cut valuable supports to public infrastructure that actually creates jobs. So we have, you know, how could you have done it better? You could have talked better and you could have stuck to your guns. But, you know, this was not an era. The early 1990s was the beginning of the end of the best thing a government can do is balance its books and get out of the way of the market. This was like the apogee of the more market, less government period. So he was, he, Bob Ray, Floyd Rock, Lochran, the NDP in general, were rowing against the general political current that was flooding the, the waterways now. We're actually in a very different moment now. Um, and it makes it easy to talk about how would you have done it differently. I think with the exception of not being good talkers <laughs> and thinking you're the smartest person in the room and imposing your will, they did everything right. As right as you could have done at that time. So let's let's talk about uh, you know some of the successes. Um, you know, it was set out to save $2 billion. They came close to that. They managed to save yeah. jobs. Um, were there other successes to the social contract? I'll go to Jane first. I think there, um, yeah, probably were. I I disagree with Armin. I think that there, there could have been some structural changes um, that would have been more lasting. I think they still mm -hmm. remained to be done and they had to be tackled by subsequent governments because um, there were still issues embedded in the way the structure had been set up. Uh, I totally agree with Armin on the, the cancellation of the uh, subways, uh, for example, is one infrastructure move that was made subsequently, um, something with which I disagreed. All of which goes to say, however, um, I think, the, sorry, and there's one other point I did want to make, and that mm -hmm. is there was an opportunity and, and a great deal of time spent, as I understand it, as an observer of the day, in attempting to negotiate with the uh, public sector unions. And those ended up breaking down and being boycotted by um, uh, QP and OPSU. And it was only after those negotiations failed that the legislation was brought in. So they just did indirectly, or directly rather, what they hadn't been able to achieve with uh, through discussions and negotiation. Um, so, you know, anything change? I don't know how to answer that question, Jan. It's 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 a long time ago. <laughs> we learned a lot of good things out of it. I agree with many of the points that Arnie made about some of the legacies, uh, both political and um, and uh, from a social structure perspective, that we're now starting to use more and more. I think stimulus spending in the circumstances of today, when interest rates are low and there is the opportunity for revenue growth, are it makes good sense. Um, so I think that the issue was very, very circumstantial at that point. Um, and because it was the first time, that's always the, the hardest time to introduce something that people are not used to. Well, let's talk about legacy. We have a, a few minutes left in the program. Armin, what's the economic legacy of those times? Backlash. I mean, everything that he, they did got undone and dramatically so by the Harris mm -hmm. government tax cuts and welfare cuts. I mean, one of the first things they did in their first year, despite the unfolding 
uh, recession was to increase minimum wages and welfare rates, which we had been talking about for years under Peterson, but they actually did it to help those who were the poorest in society. Um, and that was undone like immediately upon uh, the arrival of the Harris government. Um, less red tape. Um, so, you know, the idea of employment equity being something that businesses should be doing anyway, but if you're not going to do it, we're going to urge you to do it, um, was just like, no, that, we're not going there and we're not going to invest if you invest in your jurisdiction if you're going to force us. Um, backlash to anything to do with reducing inequalities, frankly. Like the list in the mid-1990s was remarkable. And don't forget when Ray came in, he said that their purpose was to redistribute power, uh -huh. to actually introduce the structural elements that would provide countervailing power to a power system that they felt had become too concentrated. Oh my God, talk about presaging, you know, <laughs> occupied, presaging. Like if we had actually stuck to our guns and reduced inequalities in the 1990s, Ontario would be cooking with gas right now. Very interesting. We've got a minute left, Jane. Uh, when we talk about legacy, what's the political legacy of those times? Well, it was the last NDP government, wasn't it? Right. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I, speaking personally, it ruined the phrase social contract for me. I, uh, to me, that had always been a very good thing. Um, and I think, frankly, the another lasting legacy, um, perhaps patched up now, but it drove a stake divided the labor movement between the public sector unions, the private unions. There was uh, still in 1995, 96, big debates at, um, at the UFL uh, policy conventions about whether or not they were going to support the NDP. I think that's been basically repaired, but boy, it took a long time to get over that. So those are some of the legacies that come to mind for me. Jane, Armin, great stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. A new school year begins next week. Tomorrow, how parents are feeling as kids head back to class for their third year contending with COVID-19. I'm Jan Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Nam Kiwanuka and I will see you here tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, read Steve Pagan's articles, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org daily. There is no handbook for incoming first ladies. A six-part series featuring the women who helped lead America. Women's rights are human rights once and for all. The trolling was unlike anything any first lady had faced before. She didn't blink. Our motto is, when they go low, we go high. <laughs> I'm afraid I did some things which were not usual for the lady in the White House. I know we have still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. First Ladies, narrated by Robin Wright, begins tomorrow at 10 on TVO. Be informed. I suspect for many Canadians, the revelations of the last couple of months of these children's grave sites, that will be news to them. Seek understanding. At no time during this pandemic have there been more people in intensive care units of the province. Hear diverse perspectives. Did the Senate live up to its responsibility in your view? There's an opportunity here where our words can inspire. The agenda explores the context behind the issues that matter to Ontario. Is there still a stigma with people with COVID? How much of what was going on internationally was having an effect inside Quebec. Dive into in-depth analysis and balanced coverage. Getting to the roots of how we address things like crime. These are the stories that connect Ontario. There's still a path for Doug Ford to be reelected. With reports from across the province. The opioids crisis. Anytime, anywhere. It's coverage with impact. But that's the real learning opportunity. 
A new season of The Agenda begins September 7th on TVO. Farms in Ontario.